Because I really enjoyed that last in the March. It was really cold out, but yeah, we saw the um, yeah, the great was <laughs> I give you Dale Burton so he can give you me. Um, let me just say uh, before I introduce them that if there are people here who would like to give a presentation at one of our meetings, uh, we can arrange that. Um, Quite frankly, there's only one opening left this year uh, at the Macomb meeting in November. That's it. Other than that, we're booked up. But I can also take uh, reservations for presentations to be given early next year. Um, so I find it to be a bit of a challenge to know how to introduce our two speakers tonight. Um, I guess we have quite a few visitors, so for their benefit, um, Jonathan Cade is our uh, president, and Diane is also one of our officers in charge of outreach, and uh, they're together uh, giving a presentation tonight. For those that are new, they're also <coughs> related by marriage. <laughs> Okay, um, and both of them have been officers for a few years now, um, and act quite active in the club. Uh, one thing I didn't actually know about Diane is she's not only interested in astronomy but also geology. And I think there'll be some of that coming out in the presentation tonight. And Jonathan, my goodness, is interested in saving the human race. Well, who is it? Well, I, <laughs> I well, can tell you a lot of groups. But how many people, <laughs> how many people put that on their resume? <laughs> so, ought to be an interesting presentation. Uh, it's it's uh, entitled, Warren Astronomical Society, Amateurs Go Professional in Arizona. Uh, might I suggest that people are in the back probably from the seeing to bring their chairs up into the center here? Yeah, the, it is, there is a lot of weight on this and not so much on this. So, yeah, I think so. So, good evening. I think just one might yeah. be good. Let's see how that goes, and if that's bad, then we'll worry about it. All right, we are going to tell you a story about these wonderful people, Dolores Hill. Oops. Uh, Button and Rick Hill, but uh, we're going to start at the beginning of their involvement with the Warren Astronomical Society and amateur astronomy in general. That beginning is, uh, as far as we know, 1975 is when they joined the Sunset Astronomical Society and then got married and moved down to the Detroit area and became members of the Warren Astronomical Society. Uh, in 1976, Rick became the first vice president and Dolores became the secretary of the club. That one year from 1976 to 77 was the only year that they spent on the board, but they had many contributions on that event. So, this is the first recorded contribution of the Hills to the Wasp when, when Dolores was still in the Sunset Astronomical Society, which is up in Bay City. And uh, it's quite an interesting poem. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, we know exactly what you are. Nuclear furnace in the sky, you'll burn to ashes by and by. But tick, 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 pulsating star, talking about pulsars, we wonder what you are. Magneto nuclear gravity ball making monkeys of us all. And twinkle, twinkle, quasi star, or quasar, you're the limit. Yes, you are, with such indecent energy. Did God not say you couldn't be? So. That was uh, an interesting thing to find in an old wasp. Another thing that I found in the, in the digitized wasps is that Rick Hill invented the Stargate picnic, which is coming up, this year's is coming up in July. 
Um, right before he joined the board, he suggested at a board meeting that we have a picnic out at Stargate, and it's been going ever since 1976. So, unfortunately, we didn't have them for too long. They moved to Arizona to become professional astronomers. This is the Warner and Swasey Observatory on Kitt Peak. It was run by Case Western Reserve University. And uh, this is the this is a photo taken from the observatory there with an inlay of the observatory itself. They moved down in early 1980 and uh, started contributing to the WASP from Arizona. So they the credit for this photo in this issue of the WASP asks, which members of the Warren Astronomical Society would give up the clear and beautiful skies of Michigan to have their own observatory on Kitt Peak, Arizona? Rick and Dolores Hill, that's who. This month, they supply the cover photograph taken at this observatory and give us a peek at the peak. Well, the peak at the peak pun stuck and became a column for a couple of years, not every month, but quite sporadically. And we got all kinds of insights that you can go read on our website about what Rick and Dolores discovered about the relationship between amateur and professional astronomers. As somebody who had begun to make that transition, even though he still considered himself an amateur at this point, um, he was heavily involved with the AABSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, that allows amateur astronomers like us to observe variable stars and report how bright they are so that scientists can look at their light curves and figure out many things about those stars. Right below this line here, he notes that Dolores and <coughs> David Levy, the discoverer of very many comets, actually hosted the AABSO meeting for this year. So he was involved in pretty much everything at this point. But uh, these, these columns are really entertaining. He has a very funny, funny writing style. Here's, a, here's another bit that kind of struck me. This is from October of 1982. They fought through, they had, even though they were in Arizona, um, the mountain that they are on is not above the cloud line most of the time. So they had clouds and rainstorms and thunderstorms. They had a lunar eclipse coming. They wanted to take a video from the observatory and they could see that the clouds are not going anywhere. So they drove all the way up to Phoenix, which is a Jeff McCloud kind of thing to do. <laughs> and uh, made it up there, got credited on the news as professional astronomers from Kitt Peak, which he took umbrage at. But he had this vision of, of 47 years from then being an 80-year-old man with uh, Dolores by his side, both observing the eclipse and telling the 30-year-old young upstarts about the great eclipse of 82 in Arizona. So that's, at this point, that's only 14 years into the future. So, so it's kind of... Amazing how fast time flies. So that is where they came from. And now I'm going to tell you about where they are now. And I am going to hand this over to you. All right. So last May, a uh, little more than a year ago, we were very fortunate to have them both as our hosts when we went down to Tucson. Um, so this is uh, the Catalina Sky Survey, for those of you not familiar with it, it's one of the many programs run by the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory there at uh, the University of Arizona. And uh, the CSS has discovered most of the known near-Earth asteroids to date. It's discovered uh, most of them since uh, 2005. And the two programs <coughs> run by the LPL, that's the CSS, and Starwatch have discovered the majority of those known, period. So this is a, a dynamo of an NEO discovering program. <clears throat> now, um, imagine if your commute to work consisted of this. Uh, if you're a professional astronomer, specifically if you're Rick Hill, it would. So these are the Catalina Mountains north of Tucson. And uh, the CSS uses uh, two telescopes in Arizona, and they have also used one down in Australia at the famous Siding Springs Observatory. Obviously, we were not going there this time. On the other hand, if you did have that commute, you might need a vehicle like that. But, but they actually use that for, for hauling stuff. So. It was kind of 
kind of strange to sit up and see that waiting there. It's like they evolved a lot of stuff. Indeed. So in this shot, tiny little Rick. Uh, yeah, maybe we should turn. Let's us right into the gates to Catalina Station. And of course, it was absolutely beautiful. And this was the first of our many uh, breaches into restricted zones, which we were able to do thanks to the hills. So uh, the two uh, University of Arizona telescopes on Mount Bigelow, which is the specific mountain there on the Catalina Range, which we visited, are 61 inch and a 28 inch. So the uh, very large observatory to the left is clearly the, the, the one bigger one, and we'll get a close up of the CSS mm -hmm. telescope in there. Uh, at the base of the 61 inch telescope is a monument to Gerard Kuiper of the Kuiper Belt and his wife Sarah. Um, he is sort of the um, founding father of planetary studies there at the uh, University of Arizona. You might even call him the father of modern planetary science. He uh, did come from the Netherlands, spent most of his career here in the U.S. in Chicago, at the University of Chicago. But like many other people, he relocated to Arizona because apparently he rather liked the weather. And he started the, what we call the LPL, the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory there. In a, at that point, it was a little bitty corner in the uh, university, and he attracted top-notch talent to Tucson to do science, and the rest uh, is magnificent. So they do have a monument there. We, we're not 100% sure. We, we think that maybe their ashes are beneath that monument, but we're not 100% sure. Yeah, nobody, nobody said, and we were a little bit afraid to ask. Is it morbid? So, Diane really likes going into areas that say positively no admittance. So, <laughs> and she does it a great deal. But <laughs> So here's just some shots inside the uh, Kuiper telescope before the work night begins. So there is a, is there an astronomer in this one, John? Uh, I think he was cut out of that. Okay. So uh, the image on the right is a close-up of the little cooling gizmo that is this tiny little guy down here, kind of like R2D2. So, this is obviously a big, modern, professional, automated telescope. It's by, it is a five-foot mirror. Yeah. Is this where you're supposed to absolutely be? Yes. Yes. And here's what the office looks like, which... Uh, a little less impressive. Yeah. But, but uh, it, you know, it looks a lot like the offices, my office, but they do arguably funner stuff. Arguably? <laughs> you must really like your job. <laughs> All right, so the uh, more humble 28-inch telescope is what the CSS uses there on Mount Bigelow, and that is what Rick runs when he <coughs> turn to do uh, the shift up there. It has a smaller dome, but it's actually slightly closer to the sky. It's on a little uh, bit more elevated hill. That was a joke. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I said, I had in the presenter notes, it's a little bit closer to the sky because it's on like a yeah. two-foot hill. Yeah, it's a two-foot hill. <laughs> so uh, you can see this looks just beautiful, the pristine blue desert sky, the sky is, uh, the dome is open, you can imagine the romance of sitting there, observing beneath the desert, well, not really. So that's where he actually works. That is a cool monitor setup. But it uh, looks a bit more like a very dated, maybe mid-1990s computer geek dead than it does a uh, romantic <laughs> observatory in the stars. <laughs> the phone has push buttons. It does. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. It felt a little bit like a time warp stepping in there and seeing the accessories. <laughs> There's some secrets there, up in the mountains. Day sleepers. Yep. Do not disturb before 1 p.m. Keep door closed. So what is the purpose of this red-lit spooky hallway? So pretty much back in the days when there were multiple astronomers living up here and not taking the road down every day, they actually have uh, 
bed space for, I think, four astronomers in a kitchen and everything else. And it actually seems like a very pleasant place to spend your time. I would prefer to stay up here rather than driving down. It's not the worst mountain. It's it's no like observatory, but it's not the best mountain. What either. was the altitude here? This is a eighty five hundred feet. Yeah. It's not it's not very high. <coughs> it's not high enough to feel an altitude sickness. At least we weren't. We didn't really need to acclimate. But yeah, they've got this beautiful rustic cabin up there with the appropriate astronomical art there on the walls and uh, the trees outside the window, and it's all very pleasant. <coughs> They also have a kitchen, so so Rick was giving us the tour of the kitchen there, and uh, you really can't read this, but this was one of those in jokes that I, I can't even read it on the screen. But uh, it's one of those things that you don't really think about, but you know they must be out there. But it's the uh, the wow, I can't even read it there. But the Paul uh, Paul something or other memorial fridge retention policy. Um, any, any food left more than a week will be removed. Because apparently, in addition to doing astronomical research, they were doing biological research in the fridge. Um, so, yeah. And of course, Rick gets to see views like this before and after his shift. So the CSS is in operation every clear night, uh, except for a small window around the full moon. And so uh, this is... Uh, if you were Rick, you would get to see this a lot. So we got a little bit of um, observing in ourselves. And and photography. We yeah. didn't get any astrophotography did, done, but we, we split the job. So. Yeah, but I've got my uh, my 15 by 70s and... Uh, I have my camera. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of comment you don't want to see walking into your observatory, and yes, he did walk into the observatory and was hiding under the stairs inside, and they managed to get him out without an outgassing event. But, uh, but it was, <laughs> clearly, it really made an impression, so. We, we found his presence fitting, given that Rick is basically looking for vermin in space. So. Sometimes they show up a little closer to home. So we did get to stay long enough to actually start participating in the observing. So there he's stacking frames, looking for moving objects, comparing, doing flip comparisons with earlier images, which is all automated. He <coughs> a lot using the command line. There's not a lot of very graphical things that he does. All Pretty much all of the pretty colors are just uh, charts showing what's happening. All of the work that he's actually doing happens in the command line window. Yeah. So it's um, very similar to my day job. But um, it, unfortunately, we started to lose energy. I had just, the morning of this day, I had flown to Detroit from Amsterdam. And then she picked me up and we drove home and got picked up two hours later to fly to Arizona. It, well, no, actually, that was several days before. But I was we still, I'm still jet lagged from this trip. So, <laughs> so then we had an interlude. So that was pretty much the end of the night up on the mountain. Did anybody have any questions about the Catalina Sky Survey? Yes, Dale. Well, I'm just wondering, what is Rick's actual title or position? He is an observer for the Catalina Sky Survey. So he's. He is one of six observers, I believe. Six or seven, yeah. Um, yeah. And then there are, I think, three or four um, staff researchers and, and then the principal investigator. So it's a very small team, but it's uh, very but he, he is he actually directly <coughs> discovers many of the asteroids himself. So he gets to name the ones that he discovers, of which you, you will hear more thereafter. Yes, I saw a hand oh, in the um, Do you really see stars? I mean, you see stars out there? You oh, see stars. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It was, the skies really were very beautiful out there. Do you really see stars in the there. sky? Like pictures in the pictures of um, anything? Yeah, I mean, if you, uh, if you look at this, uh, I wish I could blow that up a little bit, but, but this shows actually two galaxies next to one another. 
and he was looking for asteroids in there. But but out in the desert at 8,500 feet, um, you can see the Milky Way gorgeously. It, it's really a spectacular place. It's not Kit Peak. Kit Peak is at a higher elevation. Mauna Kea is at a higher elevation. But it's still a different world than we're used to in Metro Detroit. But well, there was also some moon interference the night we were there. Not enough that they yes. weren't running, but it wasn't a perfect dark sky that particular night. What time of year were you there? May. Early May. First May. <coughs> just about, yeah, just about, would have been two, a week ago last year. Yeah. Tree. So this is a bicentennial moon tree, and if, those are, if you have a green thumb, I have a special treat that I've brought. This tree is grown from seeds that were taken aboard the Apollo 14 command module by uh, astronaut Stuart Russo. And they, of course, were returned to Earth, and the seeds were distributed, and so various institutions have moon trees. I have four seed capsules from this tree. I'm keeping one, but if three lucky people would like to have a second generation moon tree of their very own, I can spot you seed capsules here tonight. Here. And it's a sycamore tree. So yes, it's a sycamore. Famous. Yeah. Unfortunately, this sycamore tree was not in the best of health. Um, it was under siege by insects, and you could actually stand there and watch sawdust raining out of it. No, that probably, that may not be there the next time we get down. Yeah, it was not the healthiest. And it's, I believe, the last survivor of the Apollo 15 was the next priest. How old is it? It was planted in 76. 76. So. Yeah. I'll show you how long it comes in. Yeah. Yep. Well, it, that was several years after, too. Yeah. So. I have a question. Yes, yes sir. Uh, has anyone ever uh, raised a moon tree in lunar regolith? <laughs> I can categorically answer that with a no. <laughs> if you'd like to try, if you have a bunch of regolith lying around, you can take one of your seat pods and try it. <laughs> Odds aren't good. <laughs> All right. So Rick is uh, doing his part to prevent uh, catastrophe of uh, near-Earth asteroid colliding with the Earth by looking for them up in the mountains. Down on the desert floor, Dolores is doing her part in examining uh, space vermin down in the labs there at the LPL. So there's that name again. Uh, Kuiper Building is one of the buildings that houses the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory there on campus. Um, this is not the building where the Phoenix Lander team or the, uh, the Rex Osiris mission team, and we'll be hearing more about that work out of. They've got their own books <coughs> on campus in the Michael J. Drake building, but there's a whole lot of action going there in the uh, Kuiper building. What was the, the domed thing in the previous slide? Was that the moon? or? Yes, it's yeah. a scale model of the moon that dates back to, I think, the, I think it's just from pre, the Apollo mission. Pre-landing, yeah, yeah. It was one of the like models that they okay. were using to model the surface. Near side activity? Yeah. There's a lot of space art all over campus. It was that was pretty cool, including a bunch of ruined mirrors of various kinds. Because they have, as Ken Burton can tell you, they have the largest mirror laboratory in the world underneath the stadium at the University of Arizona. So they have various broken mirrors and desilvered mirrors and everything else all over the campus. This was great because you could see yourself. You can see my reflection in the taking the photo. And uh, so from way down the hallway, you look very large. Oh, yeah. But yeah, this was a fun, this was a, an interactive piece of art. This one is actually a replica mirror of the um, mirror that belongs to the Space Watch telescope. Now, that is the other NEO detecting program that they have. Space Watch is located on Kitt Peak rather than in the Catalina Mountains. And it was the first uh, program to ever discover an asteroid using electronic detection. So they're very proud of that one as well. This here um, looks a bit like Mars because it was apparently used as uh, for practice with the Phoenix lander. So it's a lovely rock garden, and it actually did serve a purpose in getting Phoenix ready to go dig up ice on Mars. <coughs> Down on the 
don't know about you, but I thought that was cool. You imagine your pet subject in astronomy and imagine that you are good enough at that that somebody else is making posters with your name on it and distributing them to school kids. The moral of this is that Dolores Hill is a phenomenal human being and we should all strive to be more like Dolores. And here she is. Uh, <coughs> an exhibit celebrating what is called the OSIRIS-REx mission. We'll be talking a little bit more about that, but basically it's an asteroid sample and return mission. It is supposed to launch next year, and it will be visiting this asteroid, which had a really boring name back when this was designed. It is now called Bennu, B-E-N-N-U. And you can see scale scale models next to the model of the asteroid. So here we have the asteroid, here we have the Empire State Building, here we have the Great Pyramid of Khufu, the Eiffel Tower, and the Pentagon. So it is a very large asteroid, but it's on a human scale. Yeah. So this is, I, I don't, I think that if NASA were to capture an asteroid, we wouldn't be going for that size, we'd be going several size classes down. But, um, <laughs> but it would be really cool to visit. <coughs> and here, and another entry into the restricted area. This is a really fun trip for me. Yes, the cleaners are not allowed to go in there, so really it's perfect for us. <laughs> <laughs> so the lab that Dolores took us into uh, was a bit of a, a high holy place for those of us who are interested in geology, at least in my book. This was the lab in which the clinching evidence for an impact causing the extinction of the dinosaurs was analyzed and reported. So back in the 1980s, it looked pretty much like this, and Dolores said that they were planning to renovate it, so it may not actually look like this anymore, but this was the space, the atmosphere, in which a young postdoc working with her analyzing iridium quantities in the KT boundary layer. Or KP, KPG boundary layer, as they call it now, said, yep, something hit the Yucatan and wiped out the dinosaurs. So that was a, a deeply... Rather, rather, somebody had already posited that this yeah. is where they experimentally confirmed with samples from the KT boundary worldwide that the iridium concentrations were similar, and they also identified some of the glass spherules that are characteristic of that event that, that we got to see. So it was quite, as somebody who grew up obsessed with dinosaurs more than astronomy, seeing where it all ended was kind of uh, moving in ways that I didn't expect. Yeah. And we did not know that this was going to be the lab when Dolores led us in there, so that it was just a very fun moment for both of us. <coughs> Um, as for this setup, whereas Rick Stiggs looked a bit like uh, John's workplace in his day job as a software programmer, uh, the lab stint at the LPL reminded me of my stint working in the anatomy labs at the University of Tennessee Medical School. Unfortunately, I was working with mouse brains and not aspirin samples, but uh, definitely it brought back the memories. But pretty much every single one of those is an asteroid sample from a significant fall, and there are there are some samples whose value they weren't even able to tell us because of insurance concerns. Well, they also had this that thing where the rich guy kept bringing them stuff to analyze. Yes, basically, yeah. if you if you are a meteorite collector and uh, that and you have a lot of money to throw around, you can buy tremendously rare meteorites, and there are no shortage of labs that would be happy to tell you everything you want to know about the meteor. Right, you own in exchange for doing research on your meteorite. So, for price. So, so, for, well, just, I mean, basically for free, but this guy was spending $100,000 on a meteorite. And then they were doing analysis on the meteorite that they couldn't afford. So, everybody, everybody won. So, this is from a radiation testing lab. Those are lead blocks. Um, so, Diane was experimenting with picking them up, but uh, it is a, that, that is a great deal of mass <laughs> packed in right there. This is my favorite periodic table ever. 
I don't know if you can read it from here, but we have the elements lymph, scum, denim, tofu, hydrox, clorox, nylon, yellow, alimony, phlegm, chocolate, WD-40, teflon, velveta, irony, menthol atom, bismarck, drano, velcro, marzipan, argan, lanolin, garlic, linoleum, and then down in the, uh, down in the, then we have an insecticide group and a fantaside group. So, flint, braid, bagetta, stephanum, and then kryptonite, dilithium, cavorite, and laetrile. So, so it's, uh, you know, scientist humor is really the best. Certain <coughs> values are best. So this is the poster presentation on the Osiris-Rex campaign. There's a great deal of information packed into a fairly small space. So we're but we brought flyers. In case and we do have... Understood. Yes, we do have a bag of posters and flyers and cards and stickers here, if anybody so would like to take home a souvenir. Yeah, if you think Osiris Rex is going to be your next favorite mission, we can set you up with some swag. <laughs> <coughs> there is Dolores showing with me and um, our friend April, who came along, uh, a sample. And here's... This crazy looking thing is one of the machines that these samples actually go into for analysis. And this is a, uh, a cubic sample that has had material taken off for destructive testing. So they have countdown clocks proudly displayed in the atrium of the building, indicating when Osiris Rex will launch and when Maven was going to arrive at Mars. And, uh, that has come and gone, so yeah. 142 days out when we were there. Now, Cyrus Rex is supposed to launch in September of 2016. Uh, won't get to asteroid Bennu until 2018, and we don't anticipate that it'll be returning a sample until 2023. So that'll be very nearly to the time that uh, Rick had written about in the Wasp long ago, when. Uh, He's going to be watching the next lunar eclipse from on top of the mountain. Now, this was another little spine-tingling moment because after Dolores took us through the labs where she works at, she took us upstairs to a sleek, modern, glass, gray, I think noise-canceling sort of a lab where they had a big glass case. And that case contained very special samples, like this is from the Japanese Hayabusa uh, mission. So Hayabusa, if you're not familiar with it, was is one of Japan's national heroes at this point. They had pretty much every system on it fail that is imaginable. They managed to intercept material from a comet after all and return it to Earth despite having almost no control over the craft. And they actually, even though the sample storage material was damaged, they were able to actually get samples of the dust from a comet's tail. So it was a highly successful mission despite the worst, and Hayabusa 2, I believe, will be launching in the next year or so. But I certainly never anticipated looking at Hayabusa dust with my own eyes. Exactly. 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 No, well, actually, it's only in like two or three of yeah. those chambers. Yeah. But, but I think I think there was something like it returned a hundred samples of comet material. Yeah. You, they were hoping for ten thousand, I think. Yeah, you will probably touch a moon rock before you get to see any samples from this mission. Yeah. And this is more molten glass from the uh, lab from the uh, mirror, lab. mirror lab down underneath the stadium. So they, they took chunks. I think this is from one of the Keck mirrors that that broke. I can't remember which. It's from a prominent Very telescope, telescope. That, uh, that didn't go well, and they ended up chunking it up and, and making sculpture out of it instead. So, so our trip was over, but uh, of course Rick and Dolores are still doing science, so there's Dolores there. At the White House, yep. uh, receiving let me, target asteroids. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, as part of Osiris Rex, there's a citizen science component called target asteroids, and this is getting back to our original theme: the the borderline between professional and amateur astronomers. So, 
citizen science is intended to use the skills of people like us to do the work that professional astronomers don't have the time to do, don't have the resources to do, etc. Um, so we don't have much information on target asteroids. I think some of the literature gets into it, but uh, she was one of 12 people who were honored by the White House for involving citizens in science projects and making, making our fellow citizens more aware of science. And Rick was featured on the Smithsonian back in 2010 as uh, the face of the, the near-Earth asteroid business. And in addition to the work that, the productive work he does, just finding these objects and characterizing their orbits and determining whether or not they're going to hit us. For instance, last year they found one that passed between the Earth and the Moon. Mm -hmm. They also observed one and then calculated from their observations where it would land on Earth. This was a small a, a small meteoroid, and uh, they actually found the sample based on their calculations and measurements. But beyond all that, <coughs> he also maintains a strong love for the Warren Astronomical Society, and as a result, there are asteroids out there named after Larry Kalinowski, Diane Bargill slash McCullough slash Ingreo, Pete Quintus, Lou Fakes, Gary Ross, and Connie Tremblay, among many others. So, um, this is just, this is actually from an underpass in Tucson. Um, they had a lot of public art celebrating the contributions of astronomy to their local economy because with Pitt Peak there, astronomy is a huge part of their local budget. So, and that's pretty much what happened on our trip. So, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Where you were, it's called Catalina what? Catalina Sky Survey. Sky Survey. And they are by far the most productive asteroid detection operation currently running. Any other questions? I don't think that the Sycamore's location was helping its health, any. No, not really at all. Any other questions? Holy, do you want one of these? No, I want a moon tree. So after our meetings, if you're heading out, after our meetings, we go to the second generation moon tree. We go to the uh, National Coney Island on Van Dyke, just north of 12 Mile. And so you can just head out 12 Mile to Van Dyke and turn right, and it's What's about that? half a block from your own. So uh, we can continue discussions. Huh? Half a mile, not half a block. Four half a mile. Yes. Um, so we can continue discussions about anything from in the news Excellent. to sample and provisions to anything you'd like. Thank you for coming. Uh, so we'll see you at in Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I've been here. My name is Anthony. Nice to meet you, sir. No did anybody get more than one question? Do you know how to grow? I do not know how to grow. I am a Saturday. Oh, wonderful. I gave him to him. Yeah, we got one. We're not married. Yeah, I got one that you can go. Okay. No, like a very interesting uh, I just promise. Dedication. We, we only have four. And of
I am going to split the big one in half. I assume that they're going to be That's okay. I can't plan them. I'm going to try to split this. I only have four. You got a poster? So you, do you still want to succeed? Oh, okay. Oh, you're in a party? Okay. How come there's not enough for everybody? I was given I think so. I think each of these is a seat. So I'm going to try to see. Oh, yeah, I'm right. <laughs> Stick up from the observatory. <laughs> <laughs> One of those? <laughs> Asteroid. Discovered that. <laughs> You're right. I do. Next to this, the NASA's checker in on the door. Yes. <laughs> you want to take home? You want to eat this stuff? Okay. okay. Sure. Sir? Uh, 